If you are somebody who is a leader in the field of IT, even a CEO responsible for a team, who do you turn to for coaching as a mentor? Somebody that's been down this road before, you want to up your game, you're always looking to expand. A lot of times, you don't have somebody to turn to. There's lots of coaches out there, and that's fantastic, and they can help and empower you, but they probably don't specialize in IT or have the background like this gentleman. He is a founder and CEO, unparalleled technology leader, renowned mentor and visionary. He's been working in this field for years in consulting and helping people. And we're going to pick his brain today about all of this. Tim Gorey from Baton Pass joins us here on the program. Welcome. How are you doing? I'm doing great, Steve. Thank you very much for having me. Very unique in what you offer, because I, I, I've i spoken to lots of coaches, mentors, all of that, but none of them with the specialty of IT. How did that come to pass for you where you said, you know what, I'm in the IT field. I've spent a lot of years on, we, we'll get to your story in a moment. I'm curious how you even got to this point, but what made you, what inspired you to jump into helping others move their lives forward in this world? That's a great question. I can count on one hand, how many people I know of in the United States who do what I do literally. And I know them all. <laughs> yeah, actually, <laughs> there you go. We actually talk quite a bit and get together. And we're all kind of from different verticals. You know, my background was in education. I worked in schools for 25 mm -hmm. years in California as a technologist. Um, 13 of those years, I was a chief technology officer. And about half of that, I was a chief technology officer of a very large school district in the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. And so I had the opportunity to work with, you know, 42 people at a time in my department. And I just loved helping IT professionals move into areas in their career that they wanted to go. And often we would find IT professionals that would get stuck in a particular space. And then they were great before and became kind of miserable and, mm. you know, weren't performing as well over a period of time. And I just loved finding out what their hopes and dreams were and then helping them sort of construct a path that got them there. I, that was my favorite part of my job. And so when I left schools about three years ago and thought, what am I going to do with the rest of my life? You know, yeah. I really thought maybe I could start a business where I can do mostly that, helping IT professionals move into leadership roles and do that smoothly and really understand the the difference between being an IT professional and being an IT leader. It's a completely different role, right? And I think the, the problem that I'm really trying to solve in, in this space is that most of your IT leaders are promoted from the IT professional ranks. And yet uh, the skill set to be successful in, in both of those arenas is completely different. And so I think the IT professional often feels like, oh, this is the natural progression of my career. I'm going to get promoted into management, but then they find themselves there and often they become miserable because they try to apply the skills that work really well as an IT professional to people as an IT leader. And that doesn't mm. work very well. <laughs> so I'm getting a picture here based on people I know in the IT world who are great at what they do, but they don't necessarily have people skills. Yeah. And they want to up their game and move up the ladder, but sometimes they find themselves stuck and challenged because they've never had to deal with that before. They've only dealt, you know, with the back end of servers and things like that. Is that a lot of what you help IT people with? Yeah, I mean, it's it's actually psychologically pretty nuanced. I have a lot of research that I bring to the table as I work with folks to help them sort of break through the barriers that they get get pigeonholed into over a time as an IT professional. But this most simple way that I can put it, I think, is that IT professionals really focus on controlling things. And, and if they're really good IT professional, they control mm -hmm. things really well. <laughs> Leaders, people leaders need to lead humans. 
Uh, and so that transition from, you know, when you take your skill set that's really about controlling things and try to apply that to humans, that's where it doesn't work very well. Now, what I found, though, is that it also doesn't necessarily work very well to bring somebody in as an IT leader who doesn't have an IT background. So it's really kind of a weird situation we find ourselves in where the best answer is to have IT leaders who understand the IT work that their people are doing, but they need to be number one, I think, called to be a people leader. And so I have tools where, where we go through a process to find out, are the people who are currently IT professionals looking to get into management, are they called? to be a leader? Is that something that really is in them, you know? Hmm. And then secondly, once they decide, yes, I am called, then there's a set of skills that needs to be brought and they need to really be able to find ways to measure what great leadership actions look like every day and then give themselves um, credit each day for, for doing those things. So what you find in the IT professional realm is that the work that they do is very quantifiable. You can say, you know, if I'm a help desk technician, I closed 20 help desks today. I know that I did good work that day. And so they can go home at the end of the day and sort of pat themselves in the back and feel good about the work they did. But many of those folks struggle when they get into leadership positions to quantify what is good leadership work? How do I pat myself on the mm. back at the end of the day? <laughs> mm. We're doing great leadership work. And so I, I bring the tools for them to say, here are the things that look like great leadership for you. And here's how you quantify that every day so that psychologically you can feel good <laughs> about the work that you're doing. So many of them struggle that way. And, and I help them yeah. through that. You make that crystal clear. And as you're explaining it, I'm hearing friends and colleagues say that where they're in a position here and there's certain things that they took care of. Maybe it's a quota, whatever it is. So now I know I got past this number. I succeeded today. I did a good job. I feel good about myself. When it transitions over to a leadership role, how do you, how do you measure your productivity? How do you even yeah. know that I had a great day? You know, maybe, maybe Jennifer had an issue and with a coworker and you kind of brought them both together and it's all working and everything's great. It's cleared the air. All right. Check mark there, you know, but then there, you have the rest of the day to take care of. So, wow. How do you know if, if you're in it, that you're called for leadership? And I, I, I just want a, a brief look at that. I know that's something that would, it could take a long time. We don't have a lot of time here. We have a lot of stuff to talk about, but I'm curious, how would you know it's inside you where, yeah, you know what? I, I, I want to do that. I don't know if I can. No, it's a great question. And obviously there is a lot involved in, in answering that question. But if I were to boil it down to one thing, often it comes out in the language that people use. If you have an IT professional in your department, and you want to know, is this person future leadership material? If he or she is really called to leadership, pay attention to what that person is saying on a regular basis. Are they using the word help in the same sentence as humans? <laughs> Often what, what we find is the focus for IT professionals is on things. But for those who are called to leadership, they have an uncommon uh, desire to really help other people around them, not just to fix the problem that they're faced with, but really they'll be the types of people when they're supporting somebody that they'll fix the technical problem and then spend another five or 10 minutes teaching the person how to avoid the problem in the future, right? So that they aren't needed again. And that person is a little bit more empowered sure. to use the technology in the future. Those types of things, if you hear them talking about the desire to help others get better with the use of technology. If you see them taking a little bit extra time right. uh, to help people and train them and help them really utilize the technology better, you might have somebody who is leadership material. Would you say that person, after they fix the technical issue, then they've worked with somebody showing them how to 
use it to better their day, better their job, but they just feel so good inside about doing that, that that would be another check mark in their mind. Like, hmm, that's, I like that. <laughs> it feels good. Yeah, absolutely. And I think mm -hmm. that's the process I would go through a lot of times with IT professionals is to find out where is it that you think you want to be in your career five years, 10 years down the line? And what are the behaviors that you have that are natural to you that support that and then really help them sort of identify what it is that they love, what sort of charges their battery and when they mm -hmm. do that work mm -hmm. and help them pursue that, give them opportunities to do the, that kind of work. Unfortunately, some of the IT professionals who are called to be leaders are not considered the very best IT professionals because when you look at the data, they don't solve problems as fast as some of the others do because hmm. they will take that time to work with the human. And so sometimes our data will show, well, this is my best IT pro up here. This person's kind of in the middle and it's the best who tend to get tapped and promoted the best IT professionals. But a lot of times those are not your people who are really called to leadership and who will be your best IT leaders. So I, I really try mm -hmm. to work with IT leaders to recognize that and to help them identify the people who are future leaders in their department and give those folks a leg up in that path because you'll often find that mediocre IT professionals end up being fantastic IT leaders. Wow. You would know. And I, I truly mean that. <laughs> you've, you've, you've been there. You've worked and and influenced so many so many IT leaders. I want to go back to your beginning, working in IT. Obviously, your passion. Decades. Were you a geek when you were younger? Yeah, I I would say I'm the sort of typical geek, at least for my time. I'm 51 years old. So when I started out. I didn't have a lot of access to computers, but what I was doing as a junior hire is playing like Dungeons and Dragons, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> role-playing games with my friends. It was kind of a geeky thing to do, right? And that translated really well into playing computer games. And so for many people who are IT professionals, that's where their professional journey really starts sure. is with gaming. Yep. And so that was what it was for me. I played games with my friends in high school and turned that into love for computer gaming and had the opportunity my senior year in high school, our principal got a hundred thousand dollar grant to get a, the first computer lab that our school ever had in 1989. Wow. And at that time there were no IT professionals that were working for the school. So he tapped the, the geekiest group of friends he could find at the lunch tables and that was me and my buddies and, and said, Hey, hmm. would you guys want to take care of this lab and set it up and, and help people with it? I can set you up so that each of you has a period throughout the day where it's a class and you get a grade for it and you can sure. take care of the lab. And that's really how I got started. And I went into the air force right out of high school, had no desire to go to college at the time and was fortunate enough to get a computer systems operations job in the Air Force. And that sort of solidified that path for my career. Honestly, mine was this, my career was the same. Yeah. I'm not even kidding. Minus the, the military, um, 12th grade, um, my friend Greg and I, who was a computer geek and I wasn't, we uh, persuaded the library department to buy expensive uh, video production equipment. 12th grade, same thing. And yeah. that's where I started getting deep into video and uh, created a documentary about uh, vandalism. So, you know, the other kids were creating the vandalism. I'm doing the documentary on it. <laughs> <laughs> I won an award. It's and perfect. then I got a, like I, symbiotic, right? Yeah, you know, right. <laughs> and then I got a job like when I was 17 in radio and that, but that's where it began, you know, just that. Mm. But I'm sure. I know in myself that I felt that calling, that that's what I wanted to do even back then. And I feel the same for you. And by the way, my son is a senior and plays video games. And I never said anything to him about it. He's like, he just do you think, but I'll, of course, I'm sure like your parents, it was like, and come out of his room. All he does is play video games. Now he's going to college in the fall for cybersecurity. Yeah. 
There you go. Right. I mean, and I think all of those things, what fills your heart, you know, sort of recharges your battery when you do it. Yeah. I think working in schools for 25 years, like I did, I never thought I'd work in schools. Uh, Honestly, I didn't like school very much as a high schooler, (laughs) other than the opportunity to work with (laughs) the technology that I did. Yeah. Yeah. And I hear that story over and over again, but that actually ended up in my career in schools being my vision, my purpose. And that really was to bring an element of relevance back into schools for students and technology is kind of in a unique position to be able to do that, right? I oversaw the path from putting internet and the first computers in the classrooms all the way to the point where we were giving devices to every student. And to me, every part of that was really about bringing the real world into school and allowing students ways to express their strengths and their passions and their interests to the outside world, because I always felt like school was just this fake thing that wasn't really very relevant to my life. And and so I always wanted, as a career technology person in schools, I wanted to create the kinds of schools that I wish I had when I was in school. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And so that was really what drove me. And what I found was probably 98% of the IT people that I worked with had the same experience. They felt school was very irrelevant to them. And they worked outside of school on the things they were interested in, tinkering with computers and doing that sort of thing, and just sort of tolerated school until they got through it. And I would love it if we mm-hmm. could find ways you know, to do a better job of, of finding out what students' strengths are earlier and allowing them to get class credit for pursuing things they're interested in and figuring out how to monetize those things as a career before they're just thrown out into the world. Mm. (laughs) And all of a sudden they have to kind of unlearn the academics that they were thrust through in school and now figure out how to monetize their interest and their passions at that point. It'd be great if we could do that when they're in junior high and high school. (laughs) Totally. I appreciate your Your transparency and your insight on all of this, it rings true for me. I'm sure with many students, they just go to school, but it's it's almost like a make-believe world. Like I'm I'm learning, you know, how to do this and how to do that. Will I ever use it? Now, if there was things that they were actually interested in and they could apply it to something and have measurable results, we talked about that before. I think it also, you know, how do I, all right, so I got a good grade. All right, big deal. (laughs) I never did. I never did, by the way, but that was, you know, for another day. You know, Uh, and I think ironically, something similar happens a lot of times in commercial companies and organizations where you have an IT department or an IT leader who's disconnected to the real mission of the organization. So that's where CEOs or owners of companies will ask me, how do I know if my IT leader is doing well? And the Mm. thing that I'll always say is, well, you can ask yourself the question, is your IT leader prompted to do new things by you asking or telling them to do it? Or are they bringing you new projects because they're so in tune with the overall mission of your organization that they know how to leverage their IT department and their expertise to get that mission moving forward? So they come to you and say, hey, I have some ideas of how we can use technology to really forward the mission of the organization. And so many of your IT leaders and IT departments are stuck in this sort of maintenance mode where all they do is just keep things running. And then whenever the leadership comes to them and says, we'd like to do this new thing, it's kind of like, oh, well, I guess I'll just see if I can try to find the time to do that. Right. That's sort of the the key when I tell CEOs, if, if you're the guy with the ideas and you're kind of forcing the IT people to do what you need them to do rather than them coming to you, then your IT leader probably needs some coaching and some mm. help. I have to ask you, Baton Pass, name of your company, how did that come to pass? Yeah, it's the sort of imagery of a relay race, right? Sure. You're passing the baton on, but there's always been this idea for me in leadership but that's my goal. My goal isn't to hold on 
to the leadership of an organization, but it's to create as many new leaders as I can. And in that process, pass the baton on to them and allow them to lead. And to me, that was the sort of pinnacle of my leadership. What I was going after was to let go of as much as I could in favor of giving my folks who were coming up the opportunity to lead in those areas and not to hold on to those things, but to pass it on to them. And what I found was when I was confident enough and in tune with what was going on enough to let go of that and have faith that they'll be able to pick up that baton and run with it. That was when the best things happened in my career was when I got to that point where I was just passing it off and letting everybody in my department really run with their strengths and their passions and become the leaders that they were called to be. Well, it does start at the top, as they say, and I'm sure you prepared them for that. You didn't just throw, hey guys, here's the baton. Oh, day. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I <laughs> yeah. mean, you know, it's a mix, right? It's a mix right. of things that you do. You identify what are the skills gaps that we need to, to really plug for this person to be in a position to get to that next run in their career. But then at a certain point, you have to lay down your ego and have faith yep. and, and pass that on to them. And they're going to screw up sometimes. And that's part of the process. That's how, that's how we learn um, best is when we cement that learning with something painful <laughs> that happens, right? <laughs> that's <laughs> you how you learn. It it yeah, it's like, that's how we learn. But how you respond to that as a leader is critically important too. You know, when somebody drops the ball and fails, do you come down on them or do you help them through the process of recovering from that? Because that person doesn't need you to punish them. They usually punish themselves plenty in that process. So the question is, as a leader, how are you going to come alongside them and help them ask the critical questions that get them to the answers of what am I going to learn from this and how am I going to do things different in the, in the future? One thing I've, I've learned from you and about you today is you get into the, the psychological aspect of working with people. That's part of what drives you and motivates you. Yes, we got to make sure you have a great IT team and you're plugged in and you're innovative and all of that. But what's going on up here? It's I, I've honestly, I haven't talked to many coaches in general that go that deep, even in just a few minutes, I detected in you uh, and it's fabulous. And I, I, I really think that, that that makes you and what you do radically different. How does somebody, let's say they're in the IT world, they want to progress or a CEO and they want to empower their team. How do they find you? How does that process work? Yeah, thanks. I am big on all the social medias, but primarily on LinkedIn. Yeah, so sure. my name is pretty unique, Tim Gorey. There's a few of them out there, but none of them are technologists. And if you Google search me, you'll find that most of most of the things that come up are me. If you go to LinkedIn and connect with me there or follow me there, I post something probably five times a week that has something to do with IT leadership and how to get better. I'm sharing resources there for free all the time. So that's a great place to follow me. You can also go to my personal website at timgory.com. And that has links to everything that I do, including my business, mm -hmm. which is at itbatonpass.com. And so that's where you can read about all the services that we provide and the coaching program that I have and the different iterations of that. So all of that is there. I, I do love the psychological aspect of all this. I think it's really um, critical that you get into that because what I find often is that performance is critically tied to interest and to passion in order to get into somebody's interests and their passions and understand what those are in order for them to get the best out of themselves, the best performance mm -hmm. out of themselves. You really have to think about, you know, what it is that we're doing, why we're doing it, why we yeah. feel the way we feel when we do this or that, or the other thing and how to let go of the yeah. things that we are not individually strong at and allow other people to get involved in that. So a lot of it is about identifying unique strengths. Uh, that is a big part of, of what I do. Thank you 
thank you for being here. Learned a lot. And, uh, yeah. you know, from, from the AV squad to the geek squad, and then here we are. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Here we yeah. are. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much for the time. Oh, thank you. It. And looking forward if we get a chance to talk again. Absolutely. Appreciate yeah. it. Thanks. We're Thanks. coming right back. Broadcasting from the business capital of the world, this is the Podcast Business News Network.